We are in chapter 22 of uh, Matthew. If you'd open your Bibles, please. If you have a cell phone, and I was looking for mine, I must have left it somewhere. So if you, if you haven't turned it off yet, would you do that? Um, we're in the last week of Jesus' life here. And I believe, and I believe that I'm right when I say it, I believe that we get very confused about a lot of what we read in the scripture sometimes. And we can get very confused about what we read um, at certain portions in the Gospels and in, in, in terms of trying to determine, well, where are we really in the life of Jesus? Um, I, I know, and I'm not going to make a big deal about this, but I think it's important that we that we acknowledge, without going into a whole bunch of history about it, that um, long ago and far away, when, uh, you know, in, actually prior to the days of Constantine, so that's the fourth century AD, that's a long time, none of us were born then. Um, and it'd be even before that, but it was, it was set in stone during his time. It was determined to separate anything Jewish from anything church, okay? And so the feasts of Israel, which are very prominent in what we call, we call the Passion Week of Christ, okay? Um, the, the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, and then um, ultimately the Feast of Pentecost, but that's seven weeks later. Um, all those things were the calendar was changed, so it had nothing to do with the Jewish calendar. And that's part of the reason why, you know, when, when Passover comes, we know that Jesus was, was crucified on Passover. And yet, it's rare that Passover and... Um, and the crucifixion, whether you want to think it happens on a Friday or a Wednesday or a Thursday, it's rare that they actually coincide because it was determined by a royal imperial decree centuries and centuries and centuries ago that the church would have nothing to do with anything Jewish. What are you doing here, John? What's this all about? What this is all about is that we can get, that helps us to get even more confused as we read through the scripture. Because everybody knows that Jesus was crucified on a Friday. We know that because we have it on our calendars, Good Friday. So we know that that's when Jesus was crucified. <laughs> Except it doesn't say that in the scripture. It says he was crucified on Passover. And there, we'll get there when we get there in chapter 28. But uh, it, it's pretty obvious that some of the things that we assume are not necessarily true. In fact, there's good evidence that Jesus was crucified at least on a Thursday, possibly even, even as early as a Wednesday. We know the times when he was nailed to the cross. He was nailed to the cross at 9 a.m. And he gave up his life at 3 p.m. So he was in the tomb by probably, you know, give or take, you know, let's assume 6 p.m. that night, the night of his crucifixion. But because we look at morning as the time when the sun comes up, and Jewish people uh, on the calendar, and especially in Israel today, the day begins at sunset the day before. So that further confuses us when we read through these things. I'm saying all this because we began a couple weeks ago in looking at the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem when he comes riding on a donkey. That happens on the 10th of the month of Nisan, which seemed to coincide with April 6, 32 AD. So that seems to be when, when Jesus did that. Having said that, as you begin to try to piece, and it's a, it's a very worthwhile exercise. It's not just an exercise for pastors or theologians or guys who write commentators and stuff. It's a very worthwhile exercise for all Christians who love the Word of God to sit down with four Gospels and try to work through the different events and the little clues that are in the verses as to okay, dinner was held this time and it was held in that place and then the following morning from that place he traveled to this place and then he rode a donkey and then he did this and he did that so that you can start to put together a calendar and say this is when it looks like um, he was finally betrayed. You know, what evening he was betrayed after, after we call it the Last Supper, but the, the Passover Seder. 
I'm saying that because as we start to walk through this, um, we're just in chapter 22. That's the way we see it. It's another chapter in Matthew. But what day is it? And, and it's very easy to, to get lost in that. It's very possible that this day is Monday. That this is that he rode into, into Jerusalem on Sunday, uh, came back, overturned the tables of the money changers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then this would be Monday. It's also possible this is Tuesday. So it's somewhere between Monday and Tuesday that this is going on. But the great challenge, and that's what's important for us to understand, Jesus is meeting the greatest, I, well, the, as far as human beings are concerned, as far as his opponents were concerned, it was the greatest challenge they'd ever put up to him. They're going to throw their most difficult questions at him. They're going to try and snare him, and they're going to try to get the people or the government or someone to, to hate him, to, to, to cast him off, to kill him, to take care of things. And one of the things that's said, and you can find it in at least a couple of the Gospels, certainly in John, you can find it, and I believe you can find it in Luke. Um, you'll find it in Matthew, that they did not want to, they did want to kill him. The, the Sanhedrin wanted to kill him. But they didn't want to kill him on a feast day. Now here's the question. Why did they not want to kill him on a feast day? There's two possible answers to that. One is Jerusalem was packed. Okay, at the Passover, Jerusalem would be packed. And the people who loved him would be there. And they, could have, they would have trouble for, with the crowds. Okay, that's, so that's one part of the, of the answer to the question. The other part to the, to the answer is that the Roman governors who had responsibilities over these, we'll call them districts or counties, if you will, okay, um, they had a responsibility to keep the Roman peace. I've told you before, the, the Pax Romana. You keep it a piece of we break of your face, okay? So that's, no, so, so Pilate had that responsibility, the, you know, the Herods had that responsibility because they were appointees by Rome. They had the responsibility to keep the peace. So the last thing they wanted was a riot on a feast day when all those people would be there. They don't want a riot because now they're not keeping the peace and now they're, they're in, in Dutch with, with, um, uh, with Rome. They didn't want to do that. But you can actually, as you start to read through this, and, and I encourage you to do it on your own, to read through it, and you can see how Jesus is setting it up. Jesus is pushing it toward the feast day, that he would be crucified on Passover, the last thing they wanted to do. And then, because they're not going to kill him, they're going to have the Romans take care of it for them. Okay? So this is all leading up to that. And we're going we're to see three different groups of players here besides Jesus and, the, and his disciples, the followers and all that. But we're going to see three opponents. And those opponents are the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians. And we've looked a lot at the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees added to the law. They took the law uh, of Moses and they took the, everything that was written in, in the Tanakh, what we call the Old Testament, but in the Jewish Bible. And they added to it to, in order to, to keep the law, because they never wanted to not keep the law. They believed in the things that, that the Bible said. They believed in a resurrection, meaning a physical bodily resurrection for every person, that, for the, that the just would be raised and the unjust would be raised, Daniel chapter 12. They believed in that. They believed in an afterlife. They believed in angels. They believed in those things. And they believed in in terror, the, you know, the terror of death uh, for those who did not believe in God. And so they, they wanted to do everything possible to keep the law. The Sadducees, on the other hand, didn't believe in eternal life. They didn't believe in anything that was spiritual, which is kind of a weird thing because they actually believed in the five books of Moses. That was the only part of the Bible that they held to. They believed in that. And, and those were the two principal, uh, I call them political parties, because in a sense they were. They made up the ruling council over all of, of, of Israel, okay? This is important. It's not just political history type talk, okay? It's really important. Actually, actually the Sanhedrin came back in power for the first time since 70 AD. The Sanhedrin came back in power in Israel in 2006. 
and is headquartered in Tiberias. Look it up, don't believe me. Um, in fact, you might have heard recently that the Sanhedrin um, have, have determined that they are going to try, actually bring to trial, two people and try them in absentia. They'd like to try them personally, but they know they won't come. So the first one they're going to try is the Pope, the present Pope, the one who's coming to Philly. What, what's it, Francis? Okay. Um, they're going to they're gonna try him in absentia because he claims that Israel has no right to the, the land and for uh, the, the statements he's made and, and what they call his treachery against the, Is the, the Israeli state. Okay, um, I don't know how that's going to go. I'm just letting you know that's what they're planning to do. And, and to do. And while they're at it, they're also going to try our President Obama in absentia for the same thing. So watch that. Um, just follow it. I don't know how that's all going to turn out, but it it could be interesting. Um, there was a third party I mentioned, and they're called the Herodians, and they were the ones who um, they were they were close to King Herod. You'd probably call them closer to the Pharisees, but they really, they got their money from, from being close to Rome. And so they were called the Herodians. They liked the Herods. Those are the three parties, and we're going to see them here. So let's suppose now that it's either Monday in the afternoon or it's Tuesday, okay, and, and, and there's something going on here. There are ma massive crowds on the Temple Mount. On the Temple Mount, I've seen pictures of 100,000 or 80,000 actually Muslims praying on the Temple Mount. So I, I don't know how many thousands of people were there, but we're coming up toward toward Passover. Passover, if, if the 10th of Nisan, when Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, it was a Sunday. Passover is four days away. The 14th of Nisan is Passover. So all the pilgrims are coming there. I mean, it's a mob scene today with tour buses and everything. I can only imagine what it would have been then with donkeys and all these other animals and, and people pushing everybody else out of the way. And so Jesus is there on the Temple Mount and these people are there and all of his followers. And and so let's say it's Tuesday afternoon and the big challenge is here. I'm, I'm really setting it up because by the end of this chapter, and you're thinking if you ever get there, John, but at the end of this chapter, they're just going to walk away saying, I don't know what to do. It doesn't say that they say, I don't know what to do, but they're, they're going to walk away saying, we, we fired the best ammo we have and it didn't work. Okay. So now Jesus answered, it says, verse 1 of Chapter 22. He answered and he spoke to them again by parables. And he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who were invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. I mean, you got to, right? There's no refrigeration. You, they've been invited. Uh, your Bible may say bidden or however, it's, but they're invited. These are people that the king, these are, these are important people that the king had invited to the wedding. They're his people. They're, they're his friends. They're, 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 they're the people who were close to him. And, and he's invited them. They, they got the invite. You know what it's like. You got the invite. And they don't, none of these people say, oh, I didn't, I lost it in my pile of bills. I they don't say that, okay? They, they, they just don't go. And they, they even make fun of it at some point. They go on and, to, and do their own business. But they're invited. In fact, as you go through the, the, this, this passage here, look at how many times you see invited or bidden or, you know, they're, they're, they're requested to come. And this is a parable, right? So, so these things mean things, right? So the king, let's say the Lord, um, uh, had, he arranged a marriage for his son. We know that we're going to be invited to the marriage supper of the lamb, right? Uh, and he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Verse 4, again, he sent out other servants saying, tell them who were invited, behold, I've prepared my dinner. 
My oxen my, you know, my, and my fatted cattle are killed and all things are ready. It's, it's just going to go bad. You have to come. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and they went their ways. One to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants. Servants like prophets, okay? The rest seized his servants and treated them spitefully and killed them. And we're going to come to that one later because Jesus is going to say, which of the prophets did you not kill? You know, we, back in chapter 12, Jesus talks about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. This is a picture of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit if you think of what the parable is saying here. The parable is talking about how the Lord has said to Israel, There's, you know, I'm sending my son and, and you're invited to this. And they don't want him. They want nothing to do with him. They reject him. That's the ultimate blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is to say no to Jesus Christ. Verse 7, but when the king heard about it, he was furious and he sent out his armies and he destroyed those murderers and he burned up their city. We already saw last time about the, the, the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem and, and especially the Luke 19 version of that where he says, if you had only known on this your day what would bring you peace, it was written in the prophets, especially in Daniel chapter 9. If you'd only known on this your day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes and the days will come, about, uh, come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you, hem you in on every side, you, your women, your children within your walls, and slaughter you because you didn't recognize the time of God's coming to you. He held Israel accountable to understand that. And this is important. Before we go further here, understand all the events that are happening here are prior to the cross. Now, I know some of you well enough to know what your church backgrounds have been, and others I don't. So, some of you have come out of church backgrounds that are maybe Baptistic or, or uh, independent, um, but basically like a Baptist kind of a church, you know, and, and others maybe um, more covenantal, more like Presbyterian or Lutheran and Methodist and things like that. So you may have had some of these things explained to you differently. And a lot of times what we do, there, there's truth in the Gospels, of course, to, for us, the Christian. But when we look at it, as, as studiers, Bible studiers, right? As we look at it as Bible studiers, it's important to understand Jesus is speaking to Jewish people. He's speaking to Israel, and he's speaking to them about, and now the truths are eternal, okay? But he's speaking in real time, what we would call real time, he's speaking to them in the now about themselves and about their nation and their predicament and the offer that God had placed was placing right in front of them that he was the Messiah the long-awaited Messiah so you're gonna if you if you understand the terminology some of you're gonna say oh so you're a dispensationalist very much so and I am because I believe God is very much a dispensationalist because he works in and and that just simply means he works in chapters, so to speak, through time. He's always the same. He never changes. But he, he, do, he builds on truths and he reveals himself over time. The covenants are the covenants that he, he has made, but he exposes himself in, in various ways over time. So a dispensationalist like me would say he's speaking to Israel and the truths while eternal or, or, or you know, they, 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 they go across time are very specific to the people to whom he's, he's speaking, right? So he's speaking to the Jewish leadership of Israel. And he's applying a parable to them about a king who had this, uh, set up this wedding feast for his son, invited them to, to the wedding feast, but they refused. Second invite, they refused. They made fun of it. They scorned it. They even killed the servants that he had sent. Okay? These are pictures of the prophets whom the Lord had sent telling them about Messiah. And, and, and he says, he sent out his armies, last part of verse 7, and destroyed 
those murderers and burned up their city. It's a picture looking forward of what would happen 38 years after he's speaking here. In 70 AD when the temple is destroyed, not one stone is left on another and Jerusalem is burned to the ground. Okay, And over a million Israelis are, are killed over a space of a couple of days and the rest flee for their lives. The diaspora to, to all the corners of the earth. Okay, So then he said, verse 8, to his servants, well, the wedding is ready, right? The, the food is ready. It's going to go bad. The wedding is ready, but those who were invited, see how the, how the word invited is repeated? Those who were invited were not worthy. He didn't just say they didn't want to come. They weren't worthy of this. Therefore, he tells his servants, go into the highways and as many as you find, invite them to the wedding. The invitation now is to others. So the servants went out into the highways and they gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. They got, they got the poor, they got the middle class, they got, they got the, the, the thieves, they got the prostitutes, they got the drunks, they got the tax collectors. Everybody was invited. They didn't matter who they were, Anybody that can find because they had to consume this food, right? And they, they sent them out, all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. This is an interesting, and I believe a very important principle. That's the reason I'm, I'm not badgering you. I hope you don't feel that way. But, but I want us to understand this because we can slide over it very easily. No matter how long we've been Christians, we can slide over this stuff very, very easily. Because there'll be more things that Jesus is going to talk about in chapter 24, especially in and 25, that we're going to say, well, those apply to, to, to Christians all over the world. Yes, of course they do. But they are especially relevant and speak especially to Israel or about Israel. So, you know, we read, how many places do we read? You know, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, Paul says it, you know to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It doesn't mean make the Jew more important than the Gentile. The, uh, the point is God built a nation beginning with Abraham and called it ultimately Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. And so a nation was formed from that family called the family, the children from the, Jacob, the, from, the children from Israel, the nation of Israel. He forms a nation beginning with a promise that he makes to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. It all comes together. This all fits together. And he promises Messiah for the whole world, but that it's to come, the Messiah is to come through Israel. And that Israel has the responsibility to be a light to the whole world. By the way, at some point, he, he says to us, you're the light of the world. That's, that's our responsibility. You know, and, and very often we expect people to come to church, but he says, go and tell. So this idea of the Jew first and also to the Gentile. John chapter 1, beginning at verse 11, says that he came to those who were his own. Who are his own? Israel. But his own received him not. But to all who received him, to all who believed upon his name, he gave the right to be called the children of God. And that's who I am, because I believed on his name. I'm not Jewish. I, I, I'm a Gentile. Most of you in this room are not, are not Jewish by birth. You're Gentile by birth. But there came a point in your life where you, you received him as your, as your Lord and Savior. And you believed upon his name, which means that you believed that Jesus Christ is the only one who could pay the price for your sins. The blood that he shed on that cross was sufficient. That's the word. Sufficient. To, to blot out your sins so that God would receive you because of the faith that you had placed in his son. By grace we're saved through faith. And so we read that in John chapter 1. And later on, of course, that, that extends further. It goes out from after Israel has rejected Messiah, um, we see, and, and at, 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 at crucifixion, the church begins at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, 
but it's a Jewish church. They're Jewish believers. It wasn't all Jewish people who rejected him. There were some, and most did, but there were some who were, who were believers. And it grew fast. And then by the time you get to Acts chapter 8, there's a great, a great awakening that happens in Samaria. And Jews hate Samaritans. I mean, like nobody's business, they hate Samaritans. And, and of all people, to start to, to believe and to receive Messiah, Jesus, Samaritans? Oh my word, what's the world coming to? You know, and, and the Samaritans believe and the Holy Spirit comes upon them and the, and, the, and the apostles recognize that the Holy Spirit came upon them in the same way the Holy Spirit uh, uh, came upon the Samaritans in the same way he had come upon them when they believed. And so they realize, okay, then, then the gospel is also for the Samaritans. And, and later on, by the time we get to Acts chapter 10, Peter in the house of Cornelius, you know, he begins to tell the story story of, of, of who Jesus is and what had happened because he was invited there because this man Cornelius, um, a, a centurion, a, 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 a gentile, a, a, a man, a soldier with responsibility over a hundred soldiers, he, he's a godly man and he wants to know more about this Yeshua and, and so he sends for this man, he's heard about Peter and, and he comes up and, he, and Peter begins, to, he, first of all he goes into a gentile's house, never was a Jew to go into the house of a Gentile and, and certainly not to eat with Gentiles but he goes in because he's received a vision from God and he tells this story and suddenly the Holy Spirit comes upon all those Gentiles who were in that room it was amazing when the Holy Spirit came upon them at Pentecost but oh, the, uh, on the Samaritans the, the Holy Spirit falls and now upon Gentiles the Romans no less and, and Peter is called on the carpet by the other guys. You went into the house and you ate with Gentiles. And he tells them the story. So what I'm going through here is to explain what Jesus is saying in the parable. He invited Israel, but they wouldn't come. He invited them again, and they wouldn't come. In fact, you can go a little further if you want to, but, and say there's actually two major invitations of, of the Father to Israel, and they reject him two times until finally they look upon him whom they have pierced, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And they mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. They recognize they crucified their own Messiah. So I, I, I hope you don't mind me going through that, but it's important that we understand this in a dispensational way. So the servants, verse 10, they went out and into the highways. They gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests, but the king came in to see the guests. When the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. Now, this, isn't, this was a, an ancient Eastern custom. It's kind of hard to find a, a, something in our culture to parallel this to today. But um, the, the idea was you received when you came into an affair like that, whether it's a wedding banquet or, or some other major banquet, everybody received a garment, a kind of... Uh, kind of made everybody equal, in a sense, uh, at the party. And, but there was someone there who had been invited in, but wasn't wearing a wedding garment. And so we said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. And then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. There's a lot of prophetic overtone in all of this. You know, certainly, it, it's better that I read it sometimes than just to say these things, but, you know, Paul says it many places, but let me just read here from Romans chapter 10. Paul says, speaking of Israel, beginning in chapter 10, verse 2, he says, for I bear witness that they, Israel, has a zeal for God. And certainly they did, and we'll see that in a moment. But not according to knowledge. They, they were sincere 
in their zeal, but they didn't have knowledge of God. They didn't understand the scripture and, and how to apply it so that they would really see Messiah when he came. And this is key. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish a righteousness of their own, they have not submitted to the righteousness of God. God's righteousness is beyond our righteousness. Now, for many of us in this room, that's that's like that's like believing 101 right it's that it's not by anything we have done it's what he has done for us um, familiar passage isaiah chapter 64 verse 6 all of us are like an unclean thing in god's eyes all of us are like an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses, it's a plural, all our righteousness, all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind, they've taken us away. All our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. He's not saying all of our sins condemn us before God. He's not saying all of our sins are like a filthy rag. He's saying all the good things we do. In other words, it's our presumption that, that we think that God will accept us, receive us into that wedding banquet because, because of the things that we've done. Not so. Revelation chapter 19. Then I'm done with this. Revelation chapter 19. He says, verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. It's the righteousness that comes from God that we wear. It's a, it's a linen that we wear. For, then he said to me, now write this down, for blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the land, Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. In this parable in Matthew, he's talking about those things that, that we understand or should as Christians. That it's nothing that we do to merit salvation. And, and as simple and as elementary, you know what I mean by that, I mean as, as, as basic as that is for us as believers, how often we overlook it, how often we think, man, I've blown it again. I've blown it again. Man, I've done it again. I, you know, I, I did this, I did that, whatever it may happen to me. Well, yeah, it's, if it's sin, it has to be confessed before the Lord because our fellowship with the Lord has been broken, but our relationship with him has not been broken. And, 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 and John, the apostle says, 1 John 1, 9, if, if we confess our sins, he's faithful. He's, <laughs> I don't know, he is. He's faithful and he's just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We think, I, I messed up again. And, that, and we end up thinking that therefore, somehow we're second class Christians. But we're not. Because we're all, every single one of us in this room, has been bought with the same blood. And the value of that blood, you can't put a measure on. And if you can't measure the value of that blood, then each one of us are priceless. Even me. You know, that's amazing to me. So I, I like this. This is a, a parable that I think says so, so many, so much. Many are called, but few are chosen. You know, there's not many that end up coming in. There's a, there is a wide path. And there are many on it, and it's dumping straight into Gehenna. It's dumping straight into, into the fires of, the, of, of hell, into the lake of fire, ultimately. It's a broad way. And there are many people who are on it. And sadly, what's happening in many churches around the world today, there are many people who are on the broad way. And, and, and it, because there's no gospel there. And, and the scripture tells us exactly. So, all right. So, now come the, the big hitters. Uh, first up, the Herodians are going to come up. And they're going to challenge Jesus. So it says, verse 15, the Pharisees went and they plotted how they might entangle Jesus in his talk. 
And so they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians. So these pro-Roman Jews are the Herodians, okay? Smart guys. None of these guys, you know, just, what's the turnip truck? Fell off a turnip truck thing? You know, they didn't, I don't know if they even had turnip trucks in those days, but they didn't just fall off turnip trucks. I mean, these are smart guys, right? These Herodians and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, even though they argued a lot with each other. So they, they, the, these Pharisees send their disciples with the Herodians to Jesus saying, a teacher, we know that you're true. And we know that you teach the way of God in truth. And, and nor do you care about anyone for you do not regard the person of man. That's called flattery. Was it? Is it some old saying that um, soft soap is full of lie? Anyhow, um, uh, well, it's an old saying. It's old to me. Um, so therefore, tell us, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Or isn't it? Now, this is not the temple tax. This is the, the Roman poll tax. It had been assigned on everyone. So now, is it, is it lawful? Is it right? Um, to, to pay this tax, or, or, or is it? So they're, they're going to try and get him uh, on the horns of, of this problem. Because if he says, it's not right to pay the tax, then the Roman government, he'll be in big trouble with the Romans, and the Romans will take care of him. He'll be out of here in no time. If he says, yes, it is right to pay the taxes, to the Romans, then all of these people who are so poor, you know, the, 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 all, these, all these people who've been following him from, from the Galilee and all, uh, and especially, and the Zealots who hate the Romans are, are going to, if they don't kill him, they'll at least abandon him and, and the Pharisees and everybody's problem will be over. So we got him. We got him now. But Jesus perceived their wickedness. He says, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Hippocrites, we've probably all heard it before. Hippocrites in Greek, it means to be an actor, right? We've all seen the faces, the, the old faces, the smiley face and the sad face, right? They were masks that people would wear in, in ancient, you know, acting. And it means to be an actor. So a hypocrite is an actor. And so Jesus said, verse 19, show me the tax money. And so they brought him a denarius, a day's wage, one, a coin. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, then render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard these words, they marveled and they left him and they went their way. They marveled it, which is a nice way of saying rats. Okay, they, 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 why was that a problem? Why, why did they marvel? Why did they say rats under their breath or, or whatever they said? Because he, it was obvious. He's saying, if you're going to carry the Roman currency in, in your pocket, if you're going to be a part of this system, you have to, you have to, you have to acknowledge the king. The Bible tells, it, tells us that we're always to respect the king. We're always to respect the government. And we are to follow the laws that the government establishes. And it becomes obvious that the, that the greatest one we're to follow is God himself. And when God's law supersedes the law of the government, then we have to follow God over the laws of men. In the Bible, the, the number of places that we can find that in scripture. But, but the Bible tells us that. Romans chapter uh, 13, we find that in, um, in second in 1 Timothy. Um, we find that, and it'll come back to me in a moment. Um, but we, it's, it's, it's throughout the scripture we'll find that, that we're to follow the government. And, and he's saying, look at the coin. Whose picture is, is on it? It's a, well, it's Caesar. Or we would say it's, it's Jefferson, or it's Washington, or it's Franklin. Um, you know, if, I don't know if anybody's got any Franklins here, but if you do, just leave them up here later. But, but you know, Render to Caesar those things that are Caesar's. It's got his picture on it. Give it to him. But render to God those things which are God's. Well, what things are God's? We are. And you know, we've heard it so much before. 
uh, again, it, it, we, get, it, we become so familiar with it, we allow it to slide by. But we're made in the image and likeness of God. I think my, my greatest problem is that I see myself in my image before I see myself in God's image a lot of times. But we were created in the image and likeness of God. I mean, certainly you can look at it in terms of the creation story, right? And, and because there are a lot of things that are described for us in six days of creation. But there really are only three types of living beings or living things that are, that are created in those six days of creation. Three categories of things. There are those things which have body, okay? Plants, trees, etc. okay? They have body to them. They don't have soul. They don't have spirit. I know some people think that if you speak to your plants and things like maybe you do, I'm not mocking, that's fine. Just sing, sing away, talk away. But, um, but, but their body, that's the idea, their, their, their body. The, the next category of things that are created, and it's a big category, but it's the things that have body, but they also have life in them or soul in them. The Hebrew word is nefesh, and, and it means to have some ability, some, we, if we put it in computer terms, we'd say software, okay, that, that determines what the hardware is going to do. And we look at animals and we don't think of them as having free will. We think of them as having instincts and, and you, you can debate some of that stuff, I realize. Um, especially if I, you know, if I talk about your cat or if I talk about your dog, you'll tell me what the, they do certain things on their own. And I know there's interesting things that animals will do. But basically we're talking about um, living things that have a body, obviously, and they have a software that, that drives them, okay, that, that determines how things work and how they move and how they, we'll call it, make decisions. But of all of the three categories, there's only one being that falls in the third category. And that being is man, or if you prefer, mankind or humankind, or, okay. But it, it, when God created man in his image. Genesis, Genesis 1 verse 26, it begins there. God said, let us now create man in our image. He's speaking among himself. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are speaking together in, the, in, in God's triune nature. And together, he, they, determine to create man in the image and in the likeness of God. Does that mean that God is six foot two and overweight? No, I don't think so. Um, I, and I don't think Michelangelo got it right. I, that's just the idea. First of all, there's a triunity, right? There's the ability to, to, to think. Uh, there's ability to decide. There's ability to judge. There's ability to know right from wrong. There's ability... Um, to do so many things and ultimately that's what that's the responsibility that he gives to Adam and to Eve is dominion he doesn't give dominion over the earth to 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 the cattle or to the chickens or or to the fishes or to or to certainly not to the ticks even though they seem to be everywhere he doesn't give dominion over the world to any of them but only to the, the ones he created in his own image and likeness. He gives dominion over them. And there's more we could explore here, but, but we're created in his image. And that image, the image of God and man, was marred deeply at the fall. We still bear his image. But the image of God in man was marred deeply when the fall occurred. When man decided... I, I know it began with Eve, but, but Adam then followed her. He takes the fruit and he eats it too. The two of them experience the fall. And it was a great fall. It was a crash type fall. It was a fall unlike anything we can imagine because we see the fall from this side. We don't see it from their side. They were clothed in light. They walked with God in the cool of the day. They, you know, they, 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 they Probably the closest idea we have to, to what they might have looked like is Jesus at the Transfiguration. Brighter than the sun in light. And 
They ate the fruit and suddenly they were exposed. It says they were naked. The idea is, is that, they, that they were, the, the word naked in Hebrew comes from the word to be ashamed. Okay, there was shame. They, they, every, everything about them was now known and, and obvious to everybody else. And so they still bore the image of God, but it was now greatly, deeply, and irreparably marred unless one would save them. That's the idea. And so Jesus is saying, so give to Caesar what is Caesar. His image is on the coin. He owns it. Give it back to him if he wants it. You live under this system, and it still applies to us today. Most people, when they quote this verse today, are talking about how, you know, it's April 15th, so render to Caesar, right? That's usually where we leave it. Um, but it's not, so don't get excited. Um, but we're to also to render to God what is God's. In other words, we don't own ourselves. And that is my greatest stumbling block. That's each one of our greatest stumbling blocks, is that we act like we do own ourselves. But if, but if we know Jesus Christ is our Savior, what has happened here is that, okay, I'm, I'm, I, he paid the price for my sin. I've received this salvation by grace. I'm, I'm saved by grace through faith. The blood that he shed for me has blotted out the stain of sin in me. And, and I'm redeemed. I'm purchased back as, as his own. And my identity, though my license says John Hessler and this is my address, I have dual citizenship now. Right? Paul says in, in Philippians chapter 3 that, that our citizenship is in heaven and we, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform, key word, these lowly bodies so that they will appear to be as, as like, in other words, not appear to be, but you know, they will be like his heavenly body. We see the same thing in 1 John chapter 3. That now it doesn't appear what we shall be, but when we see him, we will see him as he is. We will have to be like him in order to see him as he is. The fullness of the, of the image of God in man will be restored, and I suspect a whole lot more than that. So he says, so render to Caesar what's Caesar, and to God's what is God. And they walked away. They marveled at this. The same day, the Sadducees, though, so... This is second hitter. Strike one just happened. Second hitter comes up. Same day, the Sadducees. And, key, and watch these, these verses carefully, or these words carefully. The Sadducees, underline it, they say there is no resurrection. Right? I told you that, but that was based on the Bible. The Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, they came to Jesus and they asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said... Now, they believed in the Torah, and so Moses wrote the Torah, the first five books so, uh, of the Tanakh. So, so they're quoting the one they believe, right? Moses said that if a man dies having no children, that his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. I know that's kind of weird. We've talked about some of this before, but very quickly. It's called the Leveret, L-E-V-I-R-A-T-E. The Leveret Law has nothing to do with Leviticus. Leveret, it comes from, from uh, Latin. And, but it, all it meant, and you can find references to it in uh, Genesis 38, Deuteronomy 25, uh, well, the, whole, the whole story of you know, Ruth and Boaz, um, where a man dies and his brother has the responsibility to take his deceased brother's wife as his own if they have not if she has not already born a son uh, and to take her as his own in order to bear up seed the whole point was to to keep the name and to keep uh, um, land in the family and and so uh, if a man dies having no children his brother shall marry his wife raise up offspring for his brother now there were with us apparently this is not a just a setup like um, the way it's written suggests that they weren't making this up, but rather that this really happened, which I just say, oh, wow. Now, there were with us seven brothers, and the first died after he had married, and having no offspring, he left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, 
and the third, even to the seventh. <laughs> this poor girl. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whoa, 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 whoa. Look at verse 23. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection. So they're mocking him, is what they're doing. Now we have the situation. We know there's no resurrection. That's just silly. So Moses says this. So in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? So they all had her. Jesus' answer is great. He basically just says, you're wrong. I love it. He says, you're mistaken. I don't know what it says in the other uh, translations. But what's that? You are in error. That's a nice way of saying, cut me a break. He says, you are mistaken. The word comes, in the Greek, it comes from the word to be deceived. Okay? Not because you don't know the scriptures, nor do you know the power of God. I think that's fascinating. You're mistaken. Why? Because you don't know the scriptures, and you do not know the power of God. Do you have any idea how many people we rub shoulders with on a regular basis. And don't mistake me when I say this. But how many people we rub shoulders with on a regular basis who go to church, who call themselves Christians, but don't know the scripture, nor do they know the power of God. And, and we all are somewhere in process, okay? I don't, don't, don't mistake what I'm saying. But it's so easy to not know the scripture and to not know the power of God. It's really a choice. It's a choice of saying, the things I want to do are more important than knowing the scripture and knowing the power of God. But to know the scripture and to know the power of God is also a choice. And if we're no longer our own because we've been bought with the price of his blood, then he's the one who's to set those priorities in our lives. He says, so you're, you're mistaken, you're wrong, you're deceived, you're in error, because you don't know the scriptures, and you don't know the power of God. It just is so true today. He goes on, verse 30, For in the resurrection they neither marry, nor are they given in marriage. Now, now this might be a surprise. To some people, okay? But he's saying, in the resurrection, when we have new bodies, is the idea. Because we're not going to be resurrected in these old bodies. We're going to be resurrected in bodies like his. So, in the resurrection, when we get the upgrade, all right? In the resurrection, he says, they neither marry, there's not going to be any weddings, in the resurrection, among those who've been resurrected, okay? Nor are they given in marriage, but they are like angels of God in heaven. Now, before, before we go, by the way, do you see, if you understand the Sadducees, right? They don't believe in eternal life. They don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in angels, so, they don't believe in the resurrection. They've said, now in the resurrection, what's going to happen? It's mockery. And he's not mocking them back. He's just letting, him know, letting them know that they don't know the scripture, they don't know the power of God, and that in the resurrection, he's talking about the kingdom era, okay? The kingdom period, a thousand years, where, where we are going to be raised incorruptible. There will be people who have come in from the tribulation uh, who have bodies like our own, and they will last longer than these present bodies do, but they're still the same bodies that they were born with. But we will have new bodies because we knew Christ before all this took place. So among us who have these resurrected bodies or the new bodies, we're not going to be... Um, giving in marriage, when there's no marrying that's going to be going on. He says, but they are like the angels of God in heaven. So he's kind of, I don't want to say sticking it to him, but he's just reminding them that because they don't know the, the scripture and they don't know the power of God, they also overlook the fact that they can't compare to anything because they're, they ignore that, they're, that there are angels. But instead, the people, the resurrected ones, are like are like the angels. And some people will say, you know, um, 
Nah, I don't want to get into that. But, but, but that angels don't procreate, and, and that's true. Angels do not procreate. And some people say, well, how did that Genesis 6 thing happen? That's a different <laughs> issue. Um, but, but they don't procreate, it's true. And, and, and actually, whenever you read of angels, you always read of them with a masculine pronoun. That doesn't mean angels are men, because they're not. But they have a masculine pronoun. There's only so much I can explain about that one. But they're like angel, the angels of God in heaven. And what do the angels of God do? When we, when we see the angels of God in, in described in Isaiah 6, or we see the angels um, in Revelation 4, you know, and in other places in, in Revelation, they're constantly worshiping the Lord, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, or Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with His glory. And then day after day, they they continue to to sing this. Some people say, you know, that sounds almost like it's going to be kind of boring up there. I don't think that it is. Um, let me just read you a quick little passage, Revelation 22. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and from the Lamb. And in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God of, and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall see him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, no need, uh, no, uh, there, and they need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and forever. He said to me, these words are faithful, they're true. The Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly or quickly take place. And the Lord says, behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And John says, I saw these things. I, you know, I, I, I saw all this when I was there. The, heaven, sometimes people think, and we can fall into the trap of thinking, I don't know what I'll do there because it's like, will I get bored? I mean, there's not going to be any ESPN. There's no Fox News to see what's wrong with the world. There's not, you know, no, it's entirely different. We will be captivated by him, but we will also have such an upgrade beyond our imagination that, that we will rule and reign with him. And we'll see more of that as we get into um, chapter 25 of, of Matthew. He says, they're like the angels in heaven. There's no marrying that's going on there. But, and he throws this in, verse 31, and this is key. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, which you don't believe in, is kind of in parentheses, but you can't see it there. Speaking to the to Sadducees, concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you, Sadducees, by God, saying, remember, they only believed in the first five books of the Bible. So he quotes from there. He quotes from Exodus, where God is speaking to Moses. Moses says, who are you? Who should I tell the people that you are? Have you not read what was spoken to you, Sadducees, by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? Notice the verb, I am. When he's speaking to Moses, at minimum, it's 400 years after Jacob died. So he's not saying, I was the God of Abraham, I was the God of, of Isaac, I was the God of Jacob. He's saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He, Jesus says, God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. That means we live forever. He's our God forever. And we will be with him forever. And we will worship him forever. And we will rule and reign with him forever. He's forever God, and I don't comprehend forever. Uh, you're feeling like you, you just keep saying it forever, but I know that because it just it puts, it's it's eternal, and 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 you know we can we can if you like math and you can do that little squiggly and say that's infinity. Good for you, but what is infinity? 
What is eternal? We cannot comprehend eternal because our lives are finite. As far as we think something goes, we always think, well, what's on the other side of what I can't see? Or what's on the other side of what I don't understand? That's because I don't understand. Because, and I suspect because of the fall, that's been shunted off from our understanding. We don't get that now. We don't get it, get it in our minds. He says, God's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. And then, so not only the Sadducees were like, oh man, strike two. But the, but the multitudes that are there, and you got to believe, I mean, come on. The Herodians, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, these are the big deal guys. And, and, and for this itinerant rabbi from the Galilee to be coming out of these, these, uh, these problems that he's, they're giving him, like no, no problem at all. They've got to be snickering like, no one's ever talked to these guys like that before. How, do they even, how does he even answer them? So then the Pharisees are up. They're going to hit the home run. So verse 34, and the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees. They, they, they huddled. Huddle. They gathered together. What are we going to do? Okay. So one of them, a lawyer. If you're a lawyer, don't it? It's a, okay. Studied the law is the idea in, in, in the, the law of Moses. Asked him a question, testing him, saying, teacher, uh, what? It's the great commandment of the law. And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's the great Shema of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and all your soul, and all your strength. Now, there's a little change up here. And when you read it in the uh, New Testament, it's a little different than what you read in, um, in Deuteronomy. But, um, and people quibble about why. And I don't care. But he's saying the Shema. That's the first and greatest of the commandments. Here's the deal. The Pharisees debated it all the time about what was the greatest of the laws. But they, of, of, of the law of Moses, they meant the, what they called the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. All right? Jesus is going beyond that. He's saying the greatest of them is the Shema. That they shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. He says, this is the first and the great commandment. And the second. He said, this is a bonus round. Okay, you didn't ask for the second one, but here's the second. The second, he says, is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the first one's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Literally verse 5 here. And... The second one, verse 39, is from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. And, you know, we talk a lot about this, but it, it's important to see it. The horizontal relationship that we have with each other has to be based first on the vertical relationship. The vertical relationship with God enables us to have the right horizontal relationships. So the first one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Okay. And second one, love your neighbor as yourself. He says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now they didn't ask it. They weren't thinking that. They're thinking the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. You know, you shall have no other gods before me. You, you know, don't make a graven image. You know, all those things. Keep the Sabbath. That, keep it holy. All of that. That's what they're expecting. He's saying... If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and if you love your neighbor as yourself, then you will keep all of that. All the law and all the prophets hang from this. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them. So that was third strike. He answered correctly. And you can, it, it is worthwhile, we don't have time tonight to look at Mark uh, and, and Luke and their versions of it. Mark 12 and Luke 10 were, there's a couple different variations on it. Some people happen to say it happens at the same time. The Mark 12 one seems to happen at the same time as um, Matthew's recording it. The, the Luke 10 one seems to happen earlier. But and there's some different ones. That's where we find in Luke, we find the, the story of the Good Samaritan, etc. But um, 
So now the Pharisees were gathered together. Jesus said, like, now it's my turn. He said, what do you think about the Christ? But you got to kind of put it in Hebrew. What do you think about the Mashiach? Whose son is he? And they said to him, they had it. They, they got the right answer. They said, he's the son of David. Now that's exactly right. Messiah is the son of David. When 2 Samuel chapter 7, you read there, David has promised that one of your sons will never fail to sit on your throne. Um, the Messiah has to come from David's line. And so he's the son, meaning the descendant. He's son of David. Now Jesus asks a really important question. And if you have New King James, um, it, it helps you out. If you have NIV, it doesn't. If I don't know how King James does it for you, N N I NASB or any of those. But um, he quotes from Psalm 110, the most quoted Psalm in the New Testament. He said to them, well then, how is it that David, by the Spirit, can call him, can call the Messiah, Lord, or Adonai, Adoni, literally, my, my master, my Lord. How can David, by the Spirit, speaking by the Spirit, call him my Lord? Saying, and he quotes from Psalm 110, verse 1. But this is, a, this is, a, this is exactly what it says there. So, the Lord said to my Lord, but look at how it's spelled. All caps on the first Lord. So, Yehovah, David's writing, Yehovah said to Adoni, to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If he's, right, David's writing this, and they understand, the Pharisees understand, that, that Yehovah would say to Messiah, sit at my right hand. So all of that makes sense. But he's asking them a very important question that, that blows their fuses. Because he says, if David then calls him Lord, as in Adoni, my Lord, my master, how is he his son? Like it doesn't make any sense. Just because my son is taller than me, I wouldn't call him my Lord. I wouldn't call him my master. No father is going to call, like the, the, the greater doesn't call the lesser the greater title, is the idea. No one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare question him anymore. <laughs> yeah. He always gets the right answers. Let me just read something to you. We're talking about who he is, right? Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, Yehovah said to Adoni, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Yehovah shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. I mean, he goes on and he talks about all this that we don't have time to go into, but let me, let me read this to you from Psalm 8. And now the Spirit of God connects something that David will write in Psalm 8 to something that Paul or whoever you think writes Hebrews will write later on, speaking of Christ. Psalm 8, verse 1. O Yehovah, our Adonai. O Lord, our Master. O Lord, our... O, o Yehovah, our Lord, if you want to put it that way. How excellent is your name in all the earth who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you've ordained praise because of your enemies that, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've ordained, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? 
For you have made him a little lower than the angels and you've crowned him with glory and honor and you've made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. O oh, Jehovah, our Adonai, how excellent is your name in all the earth. And ending with Hebrews chapter 2. He says, For God has not put the world to come, of which we're speaking, in subjection to angels, but one testified in a certain place, David testified in Psalm 8, what is man that you're mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You have made him, Christ, a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him, Christ, with glory and honor. And you have set him, Christ, over the works of your hands. And you have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under Christ, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. It was fitting for him for whom all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. What God has done for us we hardly, I know I say this a lot, we've hardly begun to scratch the surface in understanding. But as you start to compare Scripture with Scripture and to, and to start to say, okay, Lord, reveal your Scripture to me and reveal your power to me, not for my sake, but for your glory, so that I can know you better and understand better what is ahead. And to understand that you did taste death for me. That, that I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I'm still alive. I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I, that I now live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who died for me. And that's what we're being set up for here as we go through these last chapters of Matthew. And, and here he is on Tuesday. They've, they've just struck out he asked them a question and they couldn't answer that. And now he's going to turn on the Pharisees. Yes, it's another chapter in 23, but it's not another day. And he's going to tell the crowds, watch out for these brood of vipers. And then he's going to cast seven woes upon the Pharisees. The presumptuousness of their legalism and their religiosity. It's very heavy stuff. And yet I tell you, I find it fascinating that when you, when you look at the church in Acts, you see priests who come to Christ and you see Pharisees who come to Christ. I can't say there are no Sadducees who come to Christ, but there's none recorded. Very interesting, because they knew the scripture well enough, at least, the Pharisees, that when it all came down, they realized something has happened in our midst, and it's God, and he has done this. And we can say the same thing because we live in a dark day and it's getting darker by the day. But something great has happened in our midst thousands of years ago and is beginning to unfold again in front of us. Jesus is coming back and he's coming back for us. Let's stand. Lord, we thank you for your word and these things, Lord, that, that you show us, Lord, in these chapters. Marvelous things, Lord, and, and it's amazing to see your wisdom in the way that you take on these people who think they're so smart and so wise. The wisdom of man is nothing to you, Lord. Lord, 
how we long for your righteousness in this world. Forgive us, Lord, we, we leave it to politicians a lot. And we blame others. We don't know what to do sometimes until, until I guess we get to the wall. We see these things that are happening in our nation right now, especially, Lord, the, this whole thing with the selling of body parts of, of aborted children, Lord. I can't, I can't comprehend what that must do to you. But thank you, Lord, that they behold your face. Lord, bring an end to it, we ask. Bring an end to it. Bring an end to it, Lord. And, and may your righteousness be revealed in, in our land once again. May your righteousness be, be longed for in the churches, Lord. May your, may your word be understood by the Christians and sought after by believers, Lord. And may the power of God be, be longed for, to be, to be experienced, Lord. Not for our sake, but for your glory's sake, Lord. In the churches and in this nation, Lord. Do what you must do, Lord. And, and if it looks to us like there's a judgment that's coming on this world very soon. Show us, Lord, how to live in light of that. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the security that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, if there's anyone here tonight who's never placed their faith in you, Lord, may they make the decision tonight to place their faith in Jesus Christ, the only one who could pay the price for their sins, and not to put it off any longer, Lord, because things are moving so quickly. And they don't know that they have tomorrow. None of us does. Lord, thank you. How excellent is your name in all the earth, Lord. How excellent are you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us, our great salvation, Lord. As we go, Lord, we ask that you'd fill us with your spirit, that you would bless our fellowship with one another. And until we come back to worship again, Lord, keep us safe. We look for your return soon, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, all.